Hi, this is Chandra. As we start to do our trainings through the web, we wanted you to get a little introduction to Fidelity before we meet together so that when we meet together, we can make it much more interactive because you'll already know some of the basics about CPP and CPP Fidelity. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with a quick overview of the CPP Fidelity framework. As you may already know, CPP Fidelity is comprised of six interconnected strands, reflective practice, emotional process, dyadic relational, trauma framework, content, and procedural. On the right, you see our CPP Fidelity Compass, which can be downloaded from childparentpsychotherapy.com. This compass is meant to guide us, and we'll go into it more later and during the training, but it's meant to guide us when family circumstances are complex or when there are lots of systems challenges and we might typically get lost. Other metaphors that may be helpful are to think of these strands as our DNA. They're inextricably linked, and we can also use the metaphor of the maypole, where the center pole is our reflective practice fidelity, and we wind the other strings around as we dance together and create the intervention with family members. In just a moment, I'll be talking in greater depth about the first four fidelity strands, and we'll be talking a lot more about all of them during training. But I wanted to give you an overview of how these different aspects of fidelity play together as we strive to create a therapeutic space. The green circle is meant to represent the therapeutic space. Here we are in that therapeutic space. This is the icon for reflective practice fidelity. The idea that we are integrated and able to hold multiple perspectives. In particular, we're paying attention to both the needs of the child, the little dot in orange, and the caregiver, the dot in blue. The icon in the middle is the icon for dyadic relational fidelity. The idea that we're hoping to strengthen connection, love, and the flow of communication between them. The cups represent their capacity to hold difficult emotions. And our goal here is to really be focused on both of them and to think about when are they in a good zone? When are they maybe overflowing or when are they numbing? Um, and to support both of them in being present so that they can talk about and process and make meaning of their experiences. Now, I just talked about those experiences. The clouds are meant to represent stressful and traumatic experiences that the caregiver or child may have had. And we know that this affects their communication and their relationship. So we're aware of that and we're also there to talk about it and to speak the unspeakable. We've given ourselves clouds as well, because what we know is that when we are talking and processing events that may have happened to them, that that affects us as therapists. And we also have histories that sometimes may kind of clash with um, what the family is bringing up. It may get triggered. It may bring up feelings in ourselves. And that can affect the degree to which we're able to be integrated and present and the degree to which we might be balanced in terms of who do we hold so that when I'm triggered, maybe I'm only holding the child's view and not the caregiver's view. And this is one of the ways that you can see how these different fidelity strands work together. Now, in the middle, what we have is the middle icon is, represents the goals of CPP, the content fidelity. What are we working on? Maybe what we're working on is helping the caregiver to acknowledge the child's experience of trauma. Maybe what we're working on is helping to normalize the traumatic um, reactions that they might be having, that they may each be triggered um, as they're talking or playing about what's happened or as they're interacting. Things may come up that may remind them of things that happened in the past. And one of our goals would be to help them recognize that as well as perhaps to help them be regulated in their bodies. So that's what's in the middle. That's really what we're focused on. And that CPP triangle, that triangle that's in the middle, we'll be talking more about that. That really represents our joint shared conceptualization of what they've been through, how it affects them, and how treatment might help. Now, the last uh, fidelity strand is procedural fidelity. And what you see on the left is that we create this green space through procedures because it's by talking to the caregiver 
about the child's history. What has the child been through? What are they able to acknowledge? And doing it in a benevolent, compassionate way that we form this green space. This is a space where we can be together and we can talk about some of the hardest things in your life. We can also talk about and understand what it was like for you when you were little, what you want for your child, what things you would keep, what things you might change. And this dialogue was formed early in what we call the foundational phase, sometimes using questionnaires to better understand the challenges that they're having or to better understand the experiences that they had. Now, on the right hand side, you also see that there are procedures as we leave the circle. And this is meant to remind us that as we finish treatment, it's important to sit with the caregiver and to think about what have they seen as changing. So perhaps what are the behaviors that have changed in them, in their child? What are the different ways that they're now able to communicate? And as we think about this, we want to very importantly also focus not only on what is changing, but on the caregivers thinking about why it's changed, because that's what supports sustainability. So that's where we have procedures going in. We have some in the middle, just in terms of inviting the child into treatment. And we have procedures as we leave the therapeutic space and help the family to carry this um, together. So as we talk about fidelity, it's very important to think about the parallel process. In CPP, the caregiver supports the child and the therapist supports the parent. And to do this very difficult work, we know that we also need to support the provider. That is our sort of main parallel process. And it's important that we think about fidelity, that fidelity applies not only to the therapist, but also to the supervisors who are supporting the therapist and also to the agencies where all of this work is being embedded and also to the systems as well as to the trainers and consultants who are helping you to learn CPP. So let's start with reflective practice fidelity. So this icon is meant to really represent all the things that we might have in our brains, the marbles, the maze, the things that we're trying to navigate. And it's very important that we realize that we're not just heads, but that we also have, have bodies and that it's important to be integrated. So that one of our main goals is to be regulated and to be able to be reflective. And when we think about being regulated, we think about how we are aware of our emotions and we are aware of how that affects our thinking. So that for a specific family or session, we are trying to cultivate an awareness of our emotional reactions, an awareness of our personal and or cultural biases, and also very importantly, the ability to slow down, the ability to pause. Sometimes we're able to pause in session. Sometimes we pause afterwards and think about where was I? What was I feeling? Because ideally what we want to be able to do is to have awareness of our feelings so that we slow down prior to intervening. And we'll talk more about this. So let's take what we've talked about so far and think about a family. This is Lila and Jackie. Three-year-old Lila is referred um, by her pediatrician due to developmental delays. They believe that her speech is very limited, temper tantrums, and aggressive behaviors. Jackie is her foster mom. The family is planning on adopting her, but Jackie recently had a baby. This is after thinking that she couldn't have a child. And they're very concerned about Lila's interactions with the baby. They've seen her yell at her, and she's covered her mouth with her hand. Jackie watches her when she's around the baby, but they're worried about what might happen. And as Jackie says, I can't always be around to watch her. I don't know if I can continue this way, she says. All the members of this family identify as white. So here's a small part of a session. Let's pretend that you're the therapist. Lila and Jackie are playing with blocks. Lila walks over to the toy cabinet and grabs a baby doll. You and Jackie notice that she's carrying the baby by the leg and banging it into the chair and table as she walks. Bang! Bang! She seems to be doing it on purpose. Look what she's doing, says Jackie. She takes the baby gently from Lila and holds it and says, We don't hurt baby. This is how we hold baby. Lila loses interest and walks away. 
Later, Lila takes the baby and shoves it under a blanket. She starts top taking the blocks and throwing them one by one at the blanket-covered baby. Bam. Bam. She's kind of mumbling. Mm, baby. Mm-hmm. She, can be, she doesn't have a lot of language, but she's sort of mumbling the word baby. Jackie tells her to stop, and she keeps throwing them. Jackie then takes the block, and Lila throws herself on the floor, screaming. Jackie stares at her and says, I just don't know if we can do this anymore. I'm scared she'll hurt the baby. So when we have moments that are difficult moments like this, it's really natural for us to have feelings. And in this diagram, we have all these different swirling feelings that we might have because there are many different kinds of situations that we find ourselves in. We may be feeling helpless, thinking about what do we do as this mom is not sure whether she can adopt this child and move forward. We may be feeling some hopelessness. We may be feeling tired. We may be feeling upset. We may be wanting to rescue this child, depending on what we know about them. So when we really think about reflective practice fidelity, we start by thinking about what are the feelings that come up with us when we're sitting in a difficult moment like this? And we hold the words of Dan Siegel that we name it to tame it. And that when we're aware of our stress reactions, then perhaps we can understand ourselves, accept that, and then move from that place of raw emotion. So the second strand is emotional process fidelity. And this is the icon for that strand. It's a cup and a saucer. And I'll explain why. We had so many potential icons to choose from, but I had used this metaphor with parents. Um, so if you see the cups, we can think about, and I'll actually just hold my cup up here. We can think that our bodies are a lot like cups and we all know when our cups are full, right? So we think about, I have had it up to here. And then we think about what do we need to do when our cups are this full? Well, what's interesting is that often what we need to do is we need to take a break, right? Because we've had enough. We might need to move our bodies. We might need to um, feel something soft. We might need to be with somebody that we love or have a cup of tea. And so this metaphor of, you know, where are we at emotionally as we're talking about trauma? Now, if you look at the size of the cups, you know, we see a big cup and we see a small cup and then we see a tiny little cup and the tiny cup um, really is there to remind us that little children have small bodies and that often when we're talking about difficult things, their cups fill up really fast and then they're very smart. They're maybe even smarter than we are. They know that you don't just sit there talking about these hard things. They know that you need a break, you need to switch and do something else. And so this is a really important concept to hold because sometimes when we are, you know, doing trauma work, um, we and parents become very invested in kids talking and processing about that. And what we want to remember is that one of our main goals is really to support development, to support meaning making and to support development. And that one of the ways that we support development is that we support the growing of a bigger cup. So I am somebody who did a lot of pottery. So I love the metaphor of kind of growing the cup by holding it. And what we do is we hold and support you when you have challenging emotions. And that really helps children to learn that you can have an emotion and not get stuck in it. And that's very important learning for children who have been, who've had a lot of difficult traumatic experiences. So how this translates in treatment is I would tell people sometimes that I do soundbite therapy because sometimes maybe it's the child who's brought up something difficult. They'll share something and they might say, oh, you know, daddy hit mommy. And then we say, oh, daddy hit mommy. Or we come in and they're playing it out maybe with dolls. Wham, wham, wham. And I say, oh, they're fighting. And the kid, that's enough. They need to go do something else. And so then they go 
and they may go off and they may um, want to paint or they may want to curl up in their mom's lap or they may want to run around frantically. And if we think about it, those are all really great ways to get rid of chemicals that are in your body swirling around when you talk about difficult things, right? So this particular metaphor is one that I often share with parents because I think about how when we're playing with a child or talking with a child and they switch, how will we understand what's happening? And what we might understand is that their cup got full and they are very smart and need to do something else. And so we don't always clean up the toys. We often leave them there and then the child goes and does something. Some children like to cook. They make us food. We feel really good. And then we notice that they come back to those toys that they were talking about before. They might talk about the cars um, kind of slamming or whatever. You know, they, they might start to play with a doctor's kid if it's a child with medical trauma and start popping people over all over again. So that this idea of emotional process fidelity, that you need your cup, it, it wouldn't be therapeutic if you were spilling over, right? So how do we support you in holding your emotions and in also emptying your cup? So just another visual that is often really helpful is to think of this as a thermometer, right? And so we think about the window of tolerance, that it is not therapeutic if you're feeling overwhelmed while you're talking about your history. So how as therapists are we aware of when people are going over into the orange or the red zone when they're flooding? And how are we aware of maybe when they're numbing and they're going into the sort of the blue zone, right? And what we would want to do is to be able to, to both tolerate strong emotions. So in that same way, you know, during reflective practice fidelity, we talked about how it makes sense that we have all these swirling emotions when we're thinking or talking about these difficult things. The same is true for the family and that we really want to be able to just be there with them and to say it's hard to think about these things. So for example, for Jackie, you're really worried about the baby, right? And that you love Lila, but you're also concerned about the way that she plays. Right? So we might hold some of that there, right? And hold that affect, even though we so wish that she wasn't concerned. We so wish that we could just take that away and say, but you know, and we'll come back as we go through the strands with what else we might say that might bring them back together, right? So some of our other goals that maybe aren't so well illustrated in that example are to promote co-regulation, to think about how the families come back together after they get triggered. So let's go back to this session. I talked a little bit about how Jackie might be doing and the feelings that Jackie is having that she's scared, she's worried, she's concerned. Um, and we would want to hold and support those even though those aren't feelings that we necessarily want her to have. Now, what's also really interesting is if we look at this vignette, one of the questions is what was Lila's affect as she was playing with the baby? And what's interesting is if you slowed it down and you I'm, you know, this is a made up vignette, but what I want to share is that Lila was very focused. She didn't look triggered and she looked very purposeful. In fact, when she banged the baby by the leg, she didn't seem to be upset or flooded or angry. She seemed boom, bang. And even when she threw the blocks, it was again, very purposeful. And so we think about she wasn't in that orange zone or that red zone. So how do we maybe understand that? And now what we're doing here though, is, is that we're paying attention both to Lila and to Jackie. And if you remember that diagram before that we started with dyadic relational fidelity asks us to do, to pay attention to both and um, emotional process fidelity asks us to say, how are they both doing emotionally? And what we're seeing is at least at the end, Jackie is not doing okay emotionally and neither is Lila either because as Jackie, you know, gets upset with what Lila is doing, she takes the blocks, right? And then Lila is also upset because it seemed like whatever she was doing might also have been important to her 
And we'll think more about that as we continue on. So I can't resist a really good metaphor, and Babette Rothschild had a great one. It's the metaphor of the Coca-Cola bottle, and I really recommend that you uh, watch her do her metaphor. But what you also might do is to go out and get a soda, it doesn't need to be a Coca-Cola, but and shake it up. Shake it up really well, and then open it. And just feel the feeling of opening a bottle that's under pressure because you open it a little bit and then you wait and you open it a little bit more and then you wait, right? Because we think about these bodies that are under pressure. It would be very unwise to just whoosh, open them up, right? Because it would be very messy for them and for you. And so this is also very important. And Bebet Rothschild has a beautiful metaphor of knowing when to put on the brakes. So when we're talking about trauma and we're watching people's affect, we want to make sure that they're not just plowing through and we want to make sure that we're not just plowing through because then, you know, things will happen. And it is possible with Jackie that as, you know, Lila was playing that, you know, things were bubbling up, right? And it would have been important perhaps to attend earlier to how Jackie was doing rather than later. So just here are some things that we might do. You know, we might understand and name affect and perspective and then really think about, you know, even the wording here, she played about a lot of scary things, right? And we're not seeing this particular child play with or cook, you know, with food, but just really thinking about, is she hurting the baby or is she playing about scary things happening with the baby, right? And that might be a way that even that particular intervention might support some emotion regulation because it might help mom to understand that play. And at the same time, we can hold that for mom, it's really hard to see this happen to babies um, because she worries. Right? So just to summarize, our stance is I can understand, support, and respond to your strong emotional responses. Um, a critical part of this isn't the underlying principle yet, but a critical part of this is that um, when you have had traumatic experiences, it makes sense that you're sad. It makes sense that you're angry. And before we kind of want to help you with coping or emotion socialization, one of the things that we just want to do is to acknowledge, remember that balancing of acceptance, right, with change. So we don't want to get stuck in that feeling but we very much want to hold and support it. And now the underlying principle is here are that neurobiological regulation is central to processing and making meaning, right? And it's also, remember that growing of a bigger cup, that it is a key part of returning to a healthier developmental trajectory. The other quote here comes from Bruce Perry, and it is that, you know, basically by definition, having experienced a trauma means that you had an overwhelming and terrifying loss of control. And he says, and putting people back into situations where they have no control recapitulates this and impedes recovery. And so what I take away from that is that you, you know, if you experience trauma, you may have felt overwhelmed and helpless. And in no way do we want treatment to make you feel overwhelmed and helpless. So the pacing of treatment needs to be determined really by your neurobiology. And when we're working with multiple people, when we're working with a caregiver and a child, it's really critical that we be watching both of them and that we think about how are we pacing this? How are we attending to their emotions and feelings? And that is emotional process fidelity. So as supervisors, let's, you know, think about what does the supervisor do? So we hope that in supervision, the therapist is sharing their work. They're sharing their interventions in very much the same way that we have the details of that session. And the therapist may come in saying, you know, I didn't know what to do, but they share that. And the supervisor first focuses on reflective practice fidelity, where the therapist is in understanding perspective. And then, you know, they're going to think about what are the different emotional responses of the family members? Where was Jackie? Where was Lila? Right. 
and that, you know, how do we think about kind of the way that they respond when they have emotions? And how might we think about ways to help this dyad in terms of their emotion regulation? Um, so we might learn some emotion regulation techniques, but we also might think about where we might intervene um, so that they don't get quite so triggered later on, if possible. So what does the agency understand? So the agency understands that the speed of treatment is in large part kind of um, decided by the emotional responses of family members. So for example, if we have a child who is so triggered that it's even very hard to play about this, that they are avoiding in some ways, but avoiding in a way that makes sense in the very beginning, treatment is going to go slower. So it's hard to say it can be done in this many sessions because really if we try to say it will be done in, you know, 20 sessions and you have a child who because of um, the danger that they were in, for example, perhaps by, um, perhaps by a male figure, um, they don't even want to represent the doll in play in the beginning we will really need to go with that. We might need to sort of look at the doll and say, you know, I don't think she wants to play with you right now and put it up and then see what they play with, how they build safety in the therapy until maybe they start to touch on that theme. They do it in other ways. Um, we also want to understand, you know, as an agency, um, do we choose to work with multiple children? Um, in a family. And part of that decision is really, you know, how many people's emotions are kind of what, what, what is happening in their bodies. And, you know, if we think about that thermometer, what if one child is really flooded when the other child is talking or playing about something? So they may be going at very different speeds and they may unfortunately kind of clash with each other in terms of their needs. Um, I'm remembering one little boy who I was working with his father. Um, his father had been um, violent with his mother and had really wanted to help his children to understand that he was really sorry and that he had gotten mad in a way that was scary for them. And so I saw this little boy um, and his sister with the dad. Um, the sister was five years old and she was very verbal and she just wanted to talk about everything. But as she talked, you could really see that this little boy was bubbling up and he just, his cup was full and he couldn't take it. And so his behavior, he started moving very much, running all over the place, trying to like get at the windows. And that actually took away from what she was doing. Um, and what he really needed was a space where he could do it symbolically and with lots of breaks, where she could do it more verbally with pictures, with drawings. And so as an agency, it was really critical that we think about these children have very different needs. And when they're in the same session with their dad, they're actually working in opposite ways. And so maybe actually to be efficient as we think about their emotional needs, it makes sense to either, you know, see one child first and then the next or to have two separate treatments and what makes sense. Um, in that particular case, we decided to um, have two separate treatments because that was what the dad wanted and he wanted to come in twice a week. All right. And then as we think about this, it's not always just little kids who have small cups. Grownups can have small cups too because of what they've been through. And so we both want to support them. We may need to think about extra collateral sessions to support caregivers. It makes sense that when we're talking about difficult things like violence and abuse and sexual abuse, that caregivers, you know, their cups get full, um, even in the moment. And it's important that then we create space in other settings to help them. And that space may be within the agency, or it may be outside the agency with other adult services. If we can um, link them up to people who can also think in trauma-informed ways. So let's move now to dyadic relational fidelity. And I hope that this icon is somewhat self-explanatory in terms of thinking about how we are trying to support the flow of love and communication in the dyad. And we can think about how we can have different treatment configurations. So sometimes, typically we meet with a caregiver and a child. It may be that we are meeting with multiple caregivers and the child. And there are occasions when we have collaterals alone with the caregiver, but we're very much keeping the child in mind. 
And sometimes um, we have times when, not for the whole treatment, but for portions of it, we're meeting alone with the child. And again, we are attempting to build a bridge back to the caregiver. Because dyadic relational fidelity reminds us that we really are trying to strengthen the caregiver-child relationship and to set up a system where the caregiver is viewed as the protective shield, where the caregiver is both protective and is viewed that way by the child so that they have the role as the child's guide um, through life as well as in making meaning of experiences, including traumatic and difficult experiences. So in case it helps, this is a little bit of a visual model to walk it through. We can see that the therapist is green, the uh, caregiver is, I think, teal, and the child is orange. Now, if you look at the diagram on the left, we see um, those times when we may be talking to a caregiver and the child is off in the corner playing. And what we want to remember is that that child hears us. And so if we're talking about the child and the child's behavior or what they've done or the caregiver's fears, that child hears us. So if Jackie is saying, I don't know if I can do this, um, we're thinking about, hmm, we want to listen to Jackie. She's clearly in a charged emotional state and needs support. And we're keeping that child in mind. And so that's part of dyadic relational fidelity. And we're thinking about how is this landing on them? And how might we translate what might we say? Right Now, in the picture in the middle, what we see is the therapist is very closely aligned with the child. And the caregiver is out there. And that could be maybe, you know, it's sort of almost a visual of a rescue fantasy, but it can also happen in other more kind of benign times. For example, when a child is playing, and a child might be playing out a scene, and that we are trying to figure out what they're doing, or it's very um, intriguing, actually, what they're doing. Um, and we may forget that there's a caregiver. So imagine if the child is playing out a scene of violence, and the caregiver is somebody who's experienced that violence that they're playing out. We would, you know, as the child is playing, it um, might also be impacting the caregiver. And so in the picture on the right, what we see is it's aspirational. So we don't always spend all of our time this way. But Alicia often talks about closing the circle. So if on if we look at the picture on the left, the caregiver's been talking about the child, and it seems like, you know, we can, we would say this phrase of maybe it's your daddy has been telling me, and we translate your daddy is so worried. Or we think with the caregiver, if we, you know, we think about do you think that she's listening to us? Um, and Or we might notice what she's doing. So we might say it's interesting that as we've been talking, she seems to be banging, or she seems to be very quiet or curling up. I'm wondering if she's hearing what we're saying. Right, so just bringing attention. And of course, if you cross that with emotional process fidelity, we really have to think about where is the caregiver's affect, how might they be able to receive that or not receive that in the moment? Okay. And so, and then if we look at the picture on, on the middle and we're trying to get more to the right-hand side, we might think about how do I scoop myself back out so that as the child is playing, I'm not the one playing with the child, that this isn't individual therapy with the caregiver present, right? So I might be thinking about do I ask the caregiver, you know, what do you think about how she's playing? Um, or do I translate? You know, do we say, wow, people are fighting and it's hard because people used to fight and it's so important that she can show us. I remember you saying that's something you wanted. Or do we have a caregiver who maybe could want to play and we might say, she's playing. Would you want to use your doll? to also show what you wish that you could do. Um, and we would see whether or not the kid wanted that. But I think this is aspirational to think about how do we come together so that we um, are more in sync versus in little pairs and split off from one another. 
And when we do have moments where a caregiver and a child are in a difficult place, like this moment with Lila and Jackie, we think about how we can do what we call a double scoop, where we might hold the perspective of the child, hold the perspective of the caregiver, and then help them to see each other if possible. So I think this is mostly what I've said. We're thinking about attending to both people, supporting both perspectives, and when possible, translate, right? And thinking about how are our translations, how are our interventions received, not just by the caregiver, um, but also by the child, by both of them, really. So let's go back to this and just think about, you know, how do we hold them both? It seems really hard because... Jackie is understandably very triggered by what Lila is doing with the baby. But this idea of what is Lila doing? Can we translate this? What is Lila doing? So let's just hold that thought because I'm going to come back because we have an incomplete picture and an incomplete story right now. But we'll come back to it and I, I move to the next slide. So within CPP, we typically recommend that as you're starting off, that you try to work with one caregiver, especially if there's a lot of conflict between the caregivers. But many of us have been moving from dyadic work to triadic or even quadratic work as we think about other partners and bringing them in, other caregivers. And so in these images, what we hope that we're showing is that when you're working with one caregiver, you are really keeping the other caregiver in mind. That you're thinking about, for example, I often think about how would you like your child to understand these things? Um, so really, if we can, meeting with that caregiver in particular. So for example, how would you like your child to understand that um, they saw you get arrested? How would you like your child to understand kind of any challenges you've been having with your mood. Um, how would you like your child to understand about what happens when people get really angry? Um, so that we're thinking about those things. So that when we're talking, so just if you look at the picture on the left, when I'm talking with one caregiver and the child, I'm really thinking about how is the way that we're talking respectful and holding the other caregiver and addressing reality at the same time. And if we move to the middle, the same is true when we're working with the other caregiver. And then on occasion, when family conflict allows is, is lower and allows us to, that we're working with everybody. All right. So again, just thinking about other caregivers, we're considering their perspective, um, and we're thinking about, you know, is it possible to know um, their story as well, so that that is part of the treatment. So what the supervisor does is the supervisor helps you to think about, you know, if you come into session, if I come into se to session, if I come into supervision, and I'm only talking about the child, it would be very important for my supervisor to sort of pause and think with me and say, what about the caregiver? Where are they? Right? If I'm only really holding that. And that would be if I'm only holding also the emotions. You know, if I'm only thinking about, wow, I don't know what to do. We really want to strive to hold both. And so that is the role. And, and it makes sense in many cases um, that we might go to one person or the other. And that's why we need a team to kind of balance us out and our team to help us think about the ways that we serve as a bridge or a conduit between the two to strengthen their relationship. So very simply, in a way, the agency just allows us to do multiple configurations, allows us to see families in dyads, in family sessions, and to be flexible. Um, and on occasion, I just want to say that the agency also recognizes that within child parent psychotherapy, sometimes there's a need for some child-only sessions from a relationship-based point of view. And there's a lot of details that I'm trying to share here. But on occasion, I just want to say that when I've worked in the area of sexual abuse or murders, um, we have children who have these embedded memories and that they might want to process, well, not want is not, but they might need to, to process or play it out 
in their own way. And as they do that, sometimes that's really hard for caregivers. So some caregivers want to be a part of that um, because they want to hear it. They want to help their child. They've already heard it, maybe. And for other people, maybe because of their own history, because of what else they're carrying in the moment, it is very hard. It actually might harm the adult. There are certain pictures and images that a grown-up doesn't need to have in their mind. So, for example, if a child's parent has been murdered and we're working with a grandparent and the child has memories of that, it is entirely possible that the grandparent doesn't need to hear those memories. And so we might think that part of treatment, it might be important for the grandparent to be able to say, um, I love you and I want to help you and, and hear, hear what you've been through. And there's some things I, I can't hear um, because it hurts my heart so much because that was my, you know, son, daughter. And so the dyadic part, really, that the relational part is that we're supporting that relationship by not having the caregiver take in those details that might actually split them apart in some ways. And of course, I think Alicia very wisely suggests that that is part of the dialogue that we have with caregivers about what the child might know, about how it might come out, about how the caregiver might want to be involved. And what Alicia would say is that um, we don't fragilize families and we let them make that decision and their choice because they are the child's guide through life and through this trauma. And so if they choose to have us join for part of that road of life, then, then that is, is their, um, their decision to make. The other thing that's really important for agencies to think about is oftentimes um, our outcomes are very child-focused in child-serving systems. The child symptoms are going down. And when we work with very young kids in the area of stress and trauma, some of the important outcomes are not child-focused, they're grown-up focused. So we all might think typically of the teething toddler, so that the child cries, um, they have teeth coming in, and what, you know, over the course of time that will of course change. But in the short run, it might not change. We might not see a symptom reduction, but what we see is a grown-up who understands and a grown-up who helps soothe the child and do beautiful things. And that, that is often the first thing that we see change is the grown-up's theory. And so, for example, we might see changes in the ways that Jackie is going to respond to Lila, um, even though Lila may still have temper tantrums, that Jackie may appreciate that, hey, Lila had a very different upbringing where she didn't maybe have somebody who was soothing her, and so that she has a need for that now. Um, and that maybe having the baby has renewed that need, brought it back with like greater strength. Um, and we'll talk about why in just a moment, because we're still missing a piece. It's been making it really hard for me to go into that particular vignette. So just let's summarize and wrap up. So our stance here is that we want to support the caregiver and child and help them see each other. And part of our rationale for this is we know, you know, Winnicott said there is no such thing as a baby. We know that development occurs in the context of relationships, that little baby feet walk with grown-ups, right? And we know that the best predictor of child functioning is caregiver functioning. And so our goal is really to support the caregiver in being that protective shield, in being bigger, wiser, stronger, kind. And one of our mantras that we hold is to try not to be a better caregiver than the caregiver. Um, that, you know, we really think about when we're pushed to intervene, how might we instead really make space for the caregiver? Um, and if they're not moving, we think about what would it be like if I moved and they didn't move? Um, so what would that be like for the child? What would that be like for the caregiver? And by move, what I mean is what if I intervened with the child and the child lit up for me and the caregiver didn't, right? If I was playing or doing something. So we might think about that. So lastly, let's go to trauma framework fidelity. And what we might hold is that infant mental health has always had reflective practice fidelity. In fact, most good trauma treatments, there's really a focus on the practitioner. And most good trauma treatments, we focus on people's emotions, their affect, right? That's where we get the window of tolerance from. 
And then infant mental health has really always focused on the power of the relationship and the relationship as being kind of where you focus on to get change, to get healthy development, right? If we, we, um, we don't just focus on the child, we focus on the relationship as the mechanism for helping the child to develop in strong and positive ways. Trauma is, however, new in some ways. It's always been around, but our focus on it in intervention is new. And as we look at the pictures here, we can think about this child who's having a tantrum. We could think about Lila, and we could wonder about why she's doing this. And of course, we might think about, okay, part of her experience is that there's a new baby. We might also remember those clouds and think about, well, what was her early history? She's in foster care. She's clearly not with her bio parents, but what's her early history? And how does this affect what's going on? So the, I'm going to read this, the, you know, driving idea here is that when either the child or the caregiver has experienced at least one traumatic event, one of our overarching goals is to help the family make meaning of what's happened and how this affects them. So it could be that the caregiver has a traumatic event and this affects the way that they raise their child, maybe because they're scared of certain things or maybe because they get upset and angry. And so we might be thinking about the way their anger shows up as coming from their history. So we'd be making meaning of the adult. But then that, of course, will affect the child because the child is being raised with that anger. Um, and it could be that the child also has had an experience and that that might, the way the child is, may trigger the caregiver. So let's just think about some of um, how this shows up in our work. So for starters, we need to ask about. We need to ask about in a benevolent way and talk to caregivers about what they've been through, about the child and family's trauma history. And then once, if they, um, if they feel like we're safe enough to share it with us, if we've earned the right to that history in a way, um, we want to develop an agreement to think with the caregiver about. So given this, what might we do with this in treatment? How might we talk about this? How might we address this? Um, how might we feel it in our bodies or think about it? And then as we're working together, um, we want to be mindful of this family's trauma history throughout the course of the treatment and to think about how it's affecting how they're doing now, how it's affecting their relationship, how it's affecting their response to intervention. And then, you know, again, with the balancing acceptance with, with change, we don't want to be stuck in that. So while the trauma may be affecting them, we want to think about what would be more adaptive ways to respond um, to that history, um, to those trauma reminders that they have, and that we would seek ways to process it um, as well. We think about how when you carry memories in your body, it's, it's almost like having a little volcano in your gut, right? And that if you try to lit it, you tend to blow. And that one of the things that actually helps is unlitting a little bit with somebody that you care about. Um, and sharing your experiences. And then again, just thinking about just taking a step back and thinking about that parallel process. How are we as therapists doing? Um, because if we are triggered, if we're experiencing vicarious trauma, if you go back to reflective practice fidelity, it'll make it really hard for us to focus on kind of both the complexity of the child and the caregiver and what's happening in the room. All right. So as we think about this, I wanted to take a moment and just review the CPP triangle that maybe you've read about in the manual. So we're taking all of that um, structured and unstructured dialogue with the family about their trauma history and our understanding of maybe their symptoms and how they're doing. And we are, you know, putting it into what we call the CPP triangle. So on the right, we have behavior and feelings. And just, I think about that often as the things that bring people down. And on the left, we have, you know, what, what led them there? What was the road that they traveled? And often when we connect that experience with the behaviors, it's like we've built this bridge. It's, I call it the bridge of understanding, right? And then we're going to think about, wow, when we understand ex that experience and what happened to you, right? The first thing that we can do is we can acknowledge it. So that's something we do in treatment is 
We want to think with the caregiver about how do we acknowledge this? How do we hold this? And then more than that, what are we thinking about what might help? Right? So we'll talk more about that. So let's go back to Lila and Jackie, because I've been struggling. I just want to say, I was like, oh, do I choose a different example? What do I do? Because I'm struggling because I haven't given you the secret information. And I often think about how, how it's harder to intervene with families when we don't know their history, even though this is a made up opinion. And so let's just pause and think about like, what is the left side of the triangle for Lila? And so what we'd learn if we talk to child welfare, we'd need to get the history there as well as from Jackie. Jackie got some of it as well is that from birth to 17 months, it seems that Lila's parents had significant substance abuse problems. They used meth and alcohol, and that things often got pretty scary with the fighting between them, and that mom was also very depressed. And so when Lila was very little, um, her development also looked really delayed, and they you know, thought that perhaps because of the depression and the substance abuse, Lila wasn't getting very much interaction. Now, what happened at 17 months is that she had a very high fever and her mom took her to the emergency room. She was throwing up. And as the doctors were checking her, they saw both bruises and they found several healed fractures. And they became really worried about her and that she was removed and placed in a foster home um, where, unfortunately, again, they removed her because it turned out that she and some of the other kids may have been abused and they found bruises on her. And then at 24 months, she was placed in the current foster home where she's been for the last year. So let's just think about this. Wow. So we didn't know that full experience when I started off talking about the vignette and reflective practice fidelity. And this is where we think about how hard it is to intervene when we don't have a view of the kid's experience. Now, sometimes we don't get to know um, because the child has moved, because it hasn't been documented, because nobody knows, because the people who were with the child when it happened um, aren't there right now. But other times caregivers, like someone like Lila's mom has shared um, because she wants her child to heal and for other reasons. Um, and so we are able to really make that connection and if we just pause for a moment, I'm just going to go backwards and we think about what Lila's doing. So look at how she goes and she grabs the baby doll. And then she very purposefully shows us that the baby gets hurt. She's banging it. And we think, wow, it's interesting because we see Jackie beautifully showing her how she's, how you would typically take care of a baby, right? And Jackie says, we don't hurt babies. But unfortunately, that's not Lila's reality. So in Lila's reality, babies have been hurt. It's a really hard thing to, to say, but it is her truth. And so even when we say, you know, this is how we hold baby, that is very true. And, and Jackie has a beautiful kind of wish and desire to show her how she would have cared for her. And yet, we can see in that moment that that's maybe if we think about the double scoop, it's not really holding perhaps where Lila is going, right? And so there's a miss. Um, and it's not that what Jackie is doing isn't beautiful. It's just that there's a miss because Lila is saying, hey, babies get hurt. Babies get owie. So let me just go back to where I was and let's think about Jackie. So when we think about what have they been through? We also want to think about the grown-ups. And Jackie comes from a history where her family, her parents had significant conflict and they divorced when she was two. And her mother was very depressed. She was in fact depressed for most of Jackie's life. And that Jackie's two older brothers had a lot of problems and they would bully her. And when Jackie was in her, you know, when she was much young, when she was younger, um, she had another partner who was very violent to her and that it took her a long time to get out of that relationship and that she's now in a loving and committed relationship, but it is hard for her to see aggression and violence and anger. 
So if we think about this, Jackie's had an experience, an experience where interestingly, there's a lot of overlap with her experience and with Lila's experience in terms of having grown up with a bit of, um, having grown up with conflict, um, although Lila's was more violent and, um, having had a depressed mother and having, you know, been hurt, having been bullied and hurt and harmed. And yet, you know, so we can think about Jackie, I mean, Jackie has an experience. And so that affects the way she responds and it affects her worries. She doesn't want to have, um, you know, it, it's really hard and triggering to think about her child, another child, being harmed by a child because that's what happened to her and her brothers potentially. So maybe, and this is maybe something that we would check out with her. So as we're looking at this, I just want to really acknowledge that when I started off, I didn't give you the whole story, but I also wanted to create an example because so often we don't have it because we didn't ask, um, because we didn't do a full assessment or because the story got lost in the system. And when that happens, when, when we can't know, when we ask and people don't tell us or we can't find out, we've still been faithful to the model. But our fidelity is that we ask. And our fidelity is that once we get their history, we try to keep it in mind during treatment. And we try to consider how this history affects interactions and interventions. And then we try to help them to, after they are sort of making meaning, to develop adaptive responsive to trauma reminders and to seek ways to process those traumatic experiences, right? So what might, I just wanted to, I'll go back to this. Just thinking about how, as we think about trauma, as we hold that history of Jackie and also of Lila, you know, it makes sense if we are triggered, just hearing those details, thinking about what a baby has been through, and then also feeling for Jackie. And so, you know, addressing trauma means that, you know, we spend maybe more effort in terms of um, thinking about metabolizing um, what we're hearing and being able to live it in the moment. And that when we're talking about these traumatic experiences, it makes sense if you think about the soda bottle, people are under pressure. They have stronger emotional responses than when we're doing other things. And that, as you saw here, um, that trauma can result, um, result in ruptures in kind of the relationship because people can be on very different pages. So Jackie may be hearing music from her childhood, I mean, not, not, not good music, but relational music um, that causes her to kind of um, see what Lila's doing through a different lens, through the lens of Lila as aggressor versus Lila as child, who is showing us that bad things happen to babies. And that's where we step in. Um, and that's also where the supervisor comes in. So you know, the supervisor would have helped us to think about how did we talk to Jackie about um, Lila's trauma history? What are the steps that we walk through? How might we connect with child welfare or with the mom to get that history? Um, the supervisor, we are a team. So we think together about when we're later on as we're watching sessions, you know, what might be showing up? How do we think about what Lila's been through? How do we think about what Jackie's been through and how do we build those bridges? How do we make connections between that history and their behavior? Um, and how do we kind of focus on affect, focus on emotions as well and body-based emotions, not just emotions in our head, but what's coming up for the caregiver and their child in their body and how might we address the trauma and vicarious trauma? So those are the things that the supervisor is trying to do. And the agency also understands that doing this type of trauma work can affect the provider. And so the agency is attentive to vicarious trauma and to thinking about not just self-care, but team care. Now, very importantly, we put this in is that when you're learning to do trauma work, it's really important to have dialogue um, related to how many very difficult trauma cases can a provider treat at the same time or how many can you start off with at the same time because often in the beginning when we're just hearing those details we haven't seen the hope because the hope is 
those moments where we understand that Lila is communicating and she's actually trying to connect with her mom. She's trying to show her. And that's actually hopeful and beautiful. Um, but until we have that hope, if we have very difficult cases where we're worried about a child's placement being disrupted or where there's ongoing violence, um, we are at high risk for burnout. And so it's important to think about how we triage and assign cases. And we'll be talking more about that at the Learning Collaborative. It's also important that the agency understand how the family's history may affect how they engage in treatment, um, how they feel when we say that we're going to end treatment. Some families have had such difficult goodbyes that they're like, I'm going to leave you before you leave me. So we get some very abrupt dropouts and this, you know, not even, and even when we've planned well. And we also have people who aren't so sure that they can trust us. Sometimes because systems have been not trustworthy other times because um, they have a history of being betrayed by other people. And so it makes sense that they worry that we as therapists might also betray them. All right. So if you take a look at the compass and the interconnected strands, what you'll see is we started by talking a little bit about how these strands are connected, how they're woven together um, to create a therapeutic space. We have, I hope you have a good overview or a definition of reflective practice fidelity and some understanding of, of emotional process fidelity, uh, thinking about the emotional states of the family members and our, how our interventions are responsive to those states. That we have talked about dyadic relational fidelity, our ability to track the dyad, our ability to hold their, both of their history and to really have interventions that connect them. And we've talked about trauma framework fidelity, right? Which really changes um, the way that we work. It changes how we understand what's happening. So what we haven't talked about yet is content fidelity, which is the goals of treatment and also procedural fidelity. We know that it helps to create the space that without it, we wouldn't know their history, right? And without it, um, we might be a little bit more blind to kind of what happens to them when they get triggered to their emotional process because by having dialogue sometimes we learn that early especially when we're talking to them about their history so we will be meeting together and we'll be continuing our dialogue we'll be sharing a more in-depth case um, with different pieces and we'll be asking you guys to um, play with these four strands and to help your colleagues to understand them in deeper ways. We'll be going deeper. Um, and also that you'll be looking for, you'll be thinking about as maybe using a supervisory lens as you look at the work. How would you help the clinician with respect to the given strand that you're assigned? So I'm looking forward to seeing you and I hope that this allows you to have at least some type of overview over the first four strands and we'll come back together and do some more. Bye-bye.